Good day, everyone. Welcome and happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I am very proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2022-2023 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. Since 2016, the Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series has focused on the use of data science methodologies, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and statistical modeling as they pertain to different themes in the biomedical and health sciences. This year's theme is Data Science and the Public Health Consequences of the COVID-19 Pandemic, where each week we enjoy presentations from leading thinkers about the issues, the promise, opportunities, and hurdles associated with understanding the secondary health effects of COVID-19. These include, but are not limited to, delayed health checkups and treatments, mental health, drug abuse, increased obesity, and the long lingering health effects associated with the SARS COVID-19 virus. Participants selected for our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these presentations as vital material for our culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held at the Lodge at St. Edwards Park in beautiful Seattle, Washington in June of 2023. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Catherine Kim from the MITRE Corporation. Dr. Kim is a health informatics researcher and expert in in digital health and community engagement. She received her PhD from UC Davis and a master's in public health and a master's of business administration from UC Berkeley and her BA from Harvard University. She is a principal of consumer health Informatics at the MITRE Corporation, which is a nonprofit organization working with government and private sectors to improve the safety, stability, and the well being of our nation. She is also an adjunct associate professor at the University of California, Davis, in their School of Medicine and Public Health Sciences Department. At MITRE, Dr. Kim currently leads the Activate group, which is a comprehensive uh, model for equitable and sustainable digital health uh, for underserved and rural communities. The Activate program provides technology and assistance to develop virtual care, remote patient monitoring, and digital health literacy, which engages patients and improves health outcomes. She also serves as the clinical lead for MITRE's Age Better Lab, um, which is a connector and collaborator with academia, government, and industry for aging research and digital health solutions. She is a fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association, chair of the Consumer Health Informatics Working Group, and she has received, received numerous awards for her community engagement uh, and her participatory research related to technology and health. In continuing with today's 2022-2023 Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series theme, today's lecture is entitled Digital Health Equity. Dr. Kim will discuss the digital health equity, including a framework for community co-production of digital health equity interventions um, that um, focused on policies and other things which interact in a local context amongst the stakeholders to deliver outcomes of digital health equity. She will also share the Activate Project, uh, a demonstration of community co-production on a platform for remote patient monitoring and chronic illness management. And as always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2022-2023 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants and alumni are encouraged to submit any questions they have via the Zoom chat sessions. I will synthesize these questions and I will ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, welcome, Kathy. We are so excited to he hear from you today. Thank you very much. I am really pleased to be here um, uh, with all of you to talk about this topic, which is near and dear to my heart, it's di digital health equity. So let's start with some definitions. Um, what is digital equity? Well, digital equity is the information technology capacity of individuals and communities to fully participate in, the, in society and the economy. Um, uh, access to broadband connectivity is a key component of digital equity. Um, and that's achieved when people and communities are all able to access and use affordable, high speed and reliable internet that meets their long-term needs. Um, there are a number of barriers to uh, digital equity for all, um, all communities, and they in include policies from the federal to the local level, practices by technology and internet companies, um, infrastructure barriers due to the geography of the built environment, 
as well as digital redlining, which is the intentional lack of investment in infrastructure and affordable services for low income and minority communities. So it's important to start with digital equity um, uh, because there's a real um, national investment happening right now um, to address these barriers. Um, this is um, funding that uh, came through last year, administered by the National Telecommunications um, and Information Administration. Um, that's called the uh, Broadband for All or Internet for All. Um, and this funding has uh, started to flow to really address the middle mile to last mile connection. So middle mile is really that, that regional level of infrastructure, um, primarily to states and regions to make sure that um, there's, there's broadband availability. And then the last mile is going from that regional infrastructure to the individuals, neighborhoods, um, and community-based organizations so that they can actually access what is available to them. So this NTIA funding um, is really in, there are multiple programs that are being funded um, that again are being, um, the, the dollars are flowing to the states, but a, a really key component of this program is to address digital equity. And so there are specific requirements um, that come with this funding to make sure that there are plans um, so that the uh, communities and the individuals who do not have access currently um, are taken care of so that they have access to this infrastructure. Um, so this is a really important national topic uh, right now. But now let's talk about digital health equity. Um, so digital health equity obviously depends on connectivity, and many people will say that uh, broadband connectivity is a social determinant of health, that access to the internet is, has become a critical component of people's ability to access health and health care. So the definition of digital health equity is access to digital health care, appropriate design of solutions, and the benefits and outcomes of digital health experiences. So it's not just access to digital tools, but it's actually making sure that those solutions, the interventions, the programs um, that we create are appropriate and accessible to all of our communities. So um, there are several frameworks that have been proposed um, for thinking about digital health equity. Um, one of those frameworks would give these sort of five drivers um, that are important to pay attention to. Um, similar to what we saw in digital equity, it also includes the policy and structural drivers. Um, it includes system level influences like the public health and the healthcare settings in a community. It includes community and social factors, such as the role of family and friends and community-based organizations. And of course, there are individual influences, such as an individual skills, digital literacy, health literacy, and their motivation to use um, these um, available digital health solutions. And then there are characteristics of the platforms themselves, such as are they usable, are they accessible? So you can see how this, um, these concepts are really large, they're big scale concepts, right? These are not um, things that you can address sort of in a silo. They really require lots of collaboration across multiple um, disciplines and multiple, multiple sectors of our, um, of our community. The other um, definition that I wanted to share is what is the digital health ecosystem? You know, there's so many terms that we use to refer to these things. Sometimes it's telehealth, sometimes it's telemedicine. Um, you know, it's, it's really the, the broad ecosystem that supports connected health. Um, so of course, connectivity is essential, but it may include systems that you're familiar with like telehealth, um, telemedicine, um, but it may be um, technologies that are used um, in, you know, in the, the delivery of very complicated um, uh, uh, services like remotely guided surgery. It includes real-time patient monitoring, and that may include for acute services like hospital at home and intensive care monitoring, but it may also be for things that are more managed by individuals, so self-care, um, self-management for things like chronic illnesses. It also includes the technologies themselves that people use, so um, data collection from sensors that are either in the environment, in the ambient environment, or that are worn by individuals. And then it includes some, some really uh, important infrastructural components, like data exchange across devices and platforms, which you can see just from those items that are in the list above, 
much of the data that is in each of these systems is not necessarily shared with other systems or with the patients themselves and often cannot be aggregated in ways um, that make it easy to compute or to analyze. Um, it also includes the ability of people to access health information and treatment information. Um, so can people get the information when they need it or can it be delivered in ways that, um, that are accessible and offered at a time um, when, when it's, it's most beneficial? We also need to be thinking about accessibility um, for, um, of course, our, our diverse population has diverse um, capabilities and capacities to interact with technology. So we need to be thinking about all the ways that we might interact with technology, including things like voice, um, mobility issues, um, other assistive um, uh, uh, features and capabilities. Um, and then things like virtual and augmented reality to make um, both treatment and uh, health information, health education, more accessible and interactive and consumable by different types of people. And then financial technologies. We know that financial health or financial um, stability and security are very tightly linked um, with, with health status. So this is not necessarily a, a comprehensive inventory, but it just shows you the breadth of technologies and systems that are part of that digital health ecosystem. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this project called Activate, which is a co community co-designed digital health equity innovation. So um, Activate is a project that was started as a partnership of University of California, Berkeley and MITRE. Um, that really started in 2020 um, when it was becoming clear that um, large health systems, academic medical centers, urban health systems were very rapidly able to pivot to telehealth and virtual care, virtual visits, um, when COVID-19 really um, was gaining a foothold in the United States. Um, within weeks, when I, I was at UC Davis Health, so within weeks we were able to um, get have you know, thousands of patient visits via telehealth. This was not the case in underserved communities and particularly in community health centers, um, in rural areas and in, in regions where they are the primary source of healthcare. And so we were very concerned um, that, that these um, community health centers were gonna be left behind and they would not be able to continue providing services to the residents that were really dependent on them for care. Um, and so we were uh, fortunate to receive an anonymous uh, donation and to, to put up the system. Um, our vision was to create an equitable digital health platform for rural and underserved communities to put the tools for health and well-being into the hands of the person and their healthcare team. And the way that we saw ourselves completing that or uh, contributing to that vision was to co-design and implement digital health solutions to really take the advantages of these new technologies and, and bring them to the community, but also to remove the barriers to impactful use. So our goals at, um, in this program were to demonstrate this Activate platform in, in, um, in three health centers. We actually completed four community health centers that are using the system now. Um, and that was done in 2021 and 2022. And then to disseminate that model across the state and the, and the nation um, and create a, a roadmap to sustainability. And that's what we're working on this year. So as I mentioned, um, we were co-designing this program with community. And so our, we used a participatory design framework, which really relies on um, the, the principles that um, anything that you uh, create for people um, has to really be um, in, intensively involved with them, both at the very beginning in defining the problem, defining the challenge and understanding um, how those people live and work. And then you need to embed with them throughout the entire process. So from design to um, testing, to implementation, to evaluation and beyond. And so that's what we did. We worked with the health center staff, including providers, nurses, medical assistants, health coaches, uh, community health workers and outreach staff. And we work with um, uh, patients of the health center with their family members and caregivers and other community members who were not receiving care at that health center. In all, we worked with about 25 um, individuals on our co-design team 
over the course of six months to produce this. As I mentioned, we were really um, trying to bring the access to technology, but also recognizing that there are a lot of barriers to um, adopting digital health solutions for both the community clinics as well as the individuals. Um, the health centers that we work with are in um, communities that are rural, that treat primarily, uh, or treat a, a large proportion of agricultural workers. Um, and so we needed to make sure that we were addressing all the barriers because if you have a solution um, and, and people are faced with many barriers to using your solution, any one of those barriers can put can you know stop the program from being successful. So we need to take a very comprehensive approach um, to addressing all the barriers that we thought might get in the way. So some of those barriers include things like um, having a digital health program that is adapted to the culture and the setting. Um, so many of our evidence-based programs like um, chronic care management, disease management programs, um, were studied and developed in academic medical centers, often in settings that have more resources, um, you know, uh, and uh, in research um, projects. So lots of things provided for you. But if you were to try and do those kinds of programs in a small community health center that doesn't have the resources, it may not be as effective as what you saw in the research. Research. So you need to really adapt what you do to the right um, to to the level that is appropriate and, and acceptable to the culture and the setting in which you're working. A second barrier for um, the clinic is technology solutions that will really work. Um, they have to be optimized for how the clinic works, the work, the clinical workflows, the staff and the level of experience that they have. Um, and they have to um, really be um, attendant to the infrastructure that's in the clinic. Um, for example, this next one is complete and interoperable data. Well, if you have an electronic health record system and you're trying to add um, remote patient monitoring, or you're trying to do telehealth visits, um, or you're trying to bring in other kinds of technology, if that doesn't interoperate with your electronic health record, if the data doesn't even go into your electronic health record, it causes um, you know, problems in terms of the workflow in the clinic, um, the availability of, of um, the data to the providers when they're offering the care, and it limits the ability to um, analyze that data later to know whether you have an a effective, um, uh, efficacious or effective program. Um, Complete and interoperable data is a, a real, a really critical uh, barrier because we see many of the solutions that are implemented in the health systems, although they could be integrated, they often are not because there's an additional expense or there's just additional resources that need to uh, sort of keep those interfaces running. Um, the next barrier is um, the availability of, of time and the experience with digital programs for the clinic staff and providers. Many of them may be individually um, technology savvy, may be using you know, um, technology for personal use, but they may have had no experience in creating a digital health program that works in, in their health center. Um, and the uh, clinics are very understaffed. Um, you know, in, in COVID, they were even more understaffed than on a, right, on a normal basis. Um, and so just having time to think about how they would create a program or having time to implement that program was really constrained. Um, and then let's move to some individual barriers. Um, many individuals in rural areas who are low income, who, are, um, uh, who may not speak English as a first language, are also the ones that um, don't have up-to-date computing devices, um, smartphones, tablets, laptops, um, or who don't have uh, connectivity. Um, so, um, you know, they, they have both health disparities and they have digital disparities. So we find that many um, individuals that are, are being served by these health centers will tell you they have a smartphone. Um, but when you ask, can they use that to download um, a recent app, they, they can't because they didn't have enough um, data in their data, prepaid data plans, or the smartphone is an older version and hasn't been upgraded, and so actually cannot, um, uh, cannot use uh, current apps. So access to up-to-date computing devices and technology, uh, uh, sorry, and internet access is a real concern. 
Um, another in, in our program was a disparity around access to remote patient monitoring devices, um, which I will tell you about in, in a little bit, but uh, most health plans do not cover remote monitoring devices. So things like glucometers, uh, connected glucometers, connected um, uh, um, uh, blood pressure machines, other kinds of things that, that you know, people may need to have on a daily basis to, to manage their condition. Um, individual digital health literacy. So many of these participants um, in rural communities, if they haven't had access to these kinds of technologies in the past, um, don't have experience. And so they're not sure how to pair devices. How do you how do you use Bluetooth? How do you know whether your your um, you know your internet um, is actually working? How do you you know connect things? So their ability to have both the digital skills and the health skills combined may be a barrier. And then finally, stable and sustainable funding. Um, many people didn't realize that prior to COVID-19, um, community health centers were not reimbursed for, for telehealth. They were actually not allowed to provide telehealth to patients in their own homes. They could be a, a clinical site and connect to a specialist for a specialty consult with the patient in, you know, in their in the clinic room, uh, but they were not allowed to provide the telehealth service um, directly to the patient. So it was only because of the public health emergency um, that allowed clinics to do to do telehealth and to be reimbursed um, in uh, for it. And so there was no funding source and so no resources for um, for health centers to do this. Um, now that we all have experience in doing telehealth, many of the health centers are able to, to do it and do it well. Um, you know, the hope is that there will be funding sources that continue um, so that we can continue with the progress that was made during the, during the pandemic. So understanding that we were trying to co-design a platform um, to uh, allow for digital health in this community health centers and address all of these barriers, um, this is what we created. So um, this is just a, a very simple rendering graphic about what we did. Um, this is a platform that is HIPAA compliant. So it does, um, it, you know, it does uh, uh, provide for both privacy and security, um, but it is flexible as well. And it was important that this is flexible because as a research and um, code design project, it was not an attempt to create a commercially available system um, that would replace what clinics were doing, but rather to be an adjunct, to be complementary to the technologies they had, um, to provide additional capabilities, and to make sure that um, all of their technology worked together so that it could be streamlined and um, efficient. So, um, the platform integrates uh, remote patient monitoring devices. Um, those devices were selected by each health center for um, what they were um, hoping to use, what they had experience using, and um, in the cases where there was insurance coverage, like under Medicare, um, uh, devices that would be actually covered by insurance if that was an option. So we have uh, seven devices that we have um, integrated uh, that are in use. Um, we provided a, a pairing app so that um, uh, participants who have these devices could download this app, um, be able to automatically pair the devices with our system that would identify the patient and identify the device. And so that data could be brought together in our servers um, and match to medical records. Um, so all that data goes into electronic health record systems and the workflows um, are, are streamlined and integrated so that it can work alongside with the virtual visit system if the health center has that, as well as other devices if there are uh, preferences for the health center for how they wanna run this system. Um, and finally, their interfaces, um, user interfaces for the program manager as well as the participants so they can see their data uh, so the, the program manager can um, run, um, you know, analyses and to see the status of all of the patients that are, are participating in the program. And then there's some analytics um, and, um, and ways for people to, to see um, uh, as a group how, how the, the uh, patients are doing and what the outcomes are. Um, so this system is used by um, participants themselves. These are all 
participants in, in the first phase of this were all participants with diabetes and hypertension. Um, and then the teamlets in the health center. And the teamlets are um, the, the healthcare provider, um, the medical assistants, health coaches, and community health workers, if they have them. Um, one of the really important things here is that the teamlet needs to really work together. And it was a model that not all health centers use, um, but it was important that they work together because this is a technology adopt, in part a technology adoption program. Um, and so it needs to be adopted by the staff at the clinic and it needs to be adopted by the participants. And so you really have to address all of that um, infrastructure and all the barriers that we talked about previously. And you have to have uh, people on the teamlet who can make sure um, that, that all of those things are being taken care of. The other important um, development here is something we call the digital health pathway. And this is the operating model um, for person-centered self-management and care coordination. Um, this is a way of modeling all of the touch points between the clinic and a participant. Um, and we created this for each condition. Um, it's customized uh, by condition as well as adjusted for each clinic. Um, and as I said, it maps every touch point. And the importance of that is to one, make sure that we understand the clinical workflow, the operational workflow, um, the, the, how the technologies should interoperate so that that's all mapped out as part of the planning process and procedures are created so that once you implement the program, it works for everyone in the clinic and it works for each of the participants. Um, the other important um, uh, concept in the digital health pathway is that with all these touch points, you, um, you really proactively think about um, how you can have each action be digital first. Um, and that means that there is a, um, a, a capability within the technology to handle it in an automated way or in, a, in um, it, uh, that the technology has the capacity to do that, but it's not digital only. And that's important because if you're gonna be person-centered, you need to recognize that not everybody has the same appetite um, or interest to use technology for every touch point. People still want a re personal relationship with their healthcare provider. And so they may not always want a virtual visit. They may want to have you know, an in-person um, visit with their provider. They may also wanna use the telephone at certain times um, and not do a, a, a video call. Or there may be times when um, you know, they, they really want um, education um, from a, a health coach and not to, to read um, or view you know, something online. So you have all these touch points that are digital first, meaning there's a capability for it to be done using the, the platform, but that's not the only way people can interact. Um, and then finally, um, it's combining the right touch with the right tech so that you, um, really tailor the support and the technology um, to the touch point and to the purpose um, or the goal that you're trying to accomplish. So this is a model that helps you to understand that and helps you to, to build for that, to design for that and implement it. So we do have outcomes. Um, we have a paper that's currently in review um, for the outcomes. Um, so I'm not gonna share the outcomes here, but we will say that um, it has achieved very substantial improvements um, for hemoglobin A1C for those with diabetes and blood pressure for those with hypertension in these health centers. So it is fully implemented. Um, and uh, we have two health centers that have a substantial number of patients. So it's in use with several hundreds of patients in two and then two additional health centers that are just um, online now and, and starting their um, enrollment of patients. So we've had very good outcomes. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the data science implications of digital health solutions like Activate. And um, this is um, research that we are, are currently undertaking. Um, uh, we started this, this research project last year and it's called the Community Connectivity Framework for Digital Health Equity. And this is a, a, a research project to really understand um, uh, how, do you in, how do you develop and implement digital health programs that will achieve health equity outcomes. Um, and there's not a lot of evidence um, actually about 
how you create those programs or even what the outcomes um, are that you should be measuring to know whether digital health um, uh, improves or, or um, impacts equity. Um, so there are some frameworks, um, one of which I shared with you in, in, in the beginning of this talk, um, but there's not a lot of evidence. Um, the second thing is the frameworks that, that are available are not focused so much on implementation. They're focused on sort of make sure um, that, uh, that we can conduct research, right? They're explanatory um, models or explanatory frameworks. So this was intended to be a very pragmatic framework that helps community organizations um, and particularly underserved communities understand how to develop interventions in ways that are evidence-based and that um, in ways that you can um, uh, assure that they're going to accomplish uh, the equity outcomes that you're hoping for. Um, and so there are um, some, some really key components here. One is that digital health, um, the digital health equity relies both on the supply and demand, right? These are economic concepts where the supply of um, uh, not only connectivity, but digital health services needs to be um, need, needs to be there. Um, and when you talk about underserved communities, um, I you know shared in those barriers that we don't have adequate supply, actually on either of those things. Um, there also needs to be demand on the the part of the communities themselves. So that's knowledge of the available solutions and the drive or motivation to use them from both the individuals and community based organizations. Um, in delivering digital health equity solutions, um, you, you know, we also chatted about how uh, multi-sectoral you know, um, collaboration needs to be a component of planning these kinds of things because there's a whole ecosystem um, underlying the delivery of digital health equity. And so partnerships are really crucial um, to uh, these kinds of interventions. Um, the, the creation of these programs, implementation and achieving outcomes also depends on the local environment. So what, um, what policies are impacting you, not just at the federal or state level, but at the local level? Um, what is the local environment like for innovation, for partnership, um, for delivery of technology? Um, and so there's this whole backdrop of the um, local context that also needs to um, be taken um, into account. And so it's a complex set of forces and interactions uh, that need to occur to create a successful intervention. And Activate was an example of this. Um, it was an example of increasing the supply. It was an example of um, uh, increasing demand. Um, it was partnership um, among a university, a private you know, non nonprofit research and development organization, um, with community health centers and members of the community to create a solution, to deliver that solution. Um, and then within the, the context of COVID-19, where there was a recognition that uh, we needed telehealth um, and digital health solutions in the, in the community health centers and policy it, uh, changes such as the public health emergency waivers that um, allowed us to actually implement such a solution. So it's an example that illustrates how you need to take into account all of these, um, these concepts when you're creating a solution. So in that, in, with the backdrop of all that complexity though, um, uh, what, you know, how, how could you actually um, sort of take advantage of data science? So um, there, there's um, a wealth of real world data. Um, in, uh, you know, we have clinical data from electronic health records. We have remote monitoring data more frequent, you know, more frequently now than has been in the past, um, but in projects like Activate and others. Um, we have person reported observations. These might be things like, um, you know, text messaging or, um, you know, individual tracking, um, self tracking um, applications, you know, those kinds of data sets that are now becoming more common. We also have environment and climate data, right? That we know has a great um, effect on, on health and particularly chronic conditions. Um, so what's the weather? What is the level of air pollution and water pollution? Um, you know, how does temperature and heat um, uh, or, or natural disasters affect people's health at particular times? 
Um, we also have social determinants of health. Um, and I will point you um, specifically to this um, citation at the bottom. That's the uh, um, from the Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation for Health and Human Services. This is a review that is, is uh, maybe of particular interest to this year's um, Data Science Innovation Lab. It was a scoping review that we conducted and published on data elements for research on the role of social determinants of health in coronavirus 2019 infection and outcomes in the US. This report um, shares you know, uh, from the research, the kinds of data sources that, that researchers were able to take advantage of, including things like clinical data, remote monitoring, person reported observations, um, environmental data, but also social determinants data. Um, not just at the individual level, but at the population level, data that comes from census, data that comes from national um, you know, cohort surveys, data that comes from indices that are calculated um, population level measures about social determinants in, in states, in regions, um, or even down to the neighborhood level. Um, so these population level data sets are also important uh, sources of real world data, um, but also the business and policy environment. Right. We have lots of data about uh, that come from the commercial sector um, and being able to access those data would, are, uh, would be very important to health, as well as policy, um, particularly with um, the Internet for All and the federal initiative and the NTIA funding. Lots of data is, is being co currently collected at both federal and state levels about connectivity, about uh, broadband speeds, about barriers to access. Um, and um, and making that data available um, for analysis is an important um, aspect of the program. So when you think about all those different sources of real world data that might help you to ask questions, and I just offer you know a couple of relevant health research questions that um, the the health centers. Um, that health researchers might be interested in um, related to um, the kinds of um, data that we have in Activate. So for example, what are the factors that contribute to a, a health condition or outcome using not just what was created in Act the data sources that were created in Activate, but also these other real world um, environmental and um, uh, commercial data sources. Um, are there natural groupings of participants? And can we use those groupings to learn uh, more about triggers that precede a particular condition or outcome? As I mentioned, we know, we, we, we hypothesize that in, um, weather conditions do impact um, you know, people with cardiac conditions, people with um, uh, uh, pulmonary conditions, respiratory conditions, uh, but also the interactions of those kinds of things also affect diabetes um, and other conditions. So what are the natural groupings of participants um, with their clinical and individual characteristics interacting with the environment that would help us to understand whether they have a condition, um, what, the, uh, what the particular outcomes might be for them, or what might trigger a worsening or improvement of a condition or outcome? And then can we predict the next episode, uh, when the next episode is likely to happen? So um, these are you know, questions that you might consider as you think about your own research um, and the data sources that you have avail available to you. Um, but um, what I'm asking here is to think about what is relevant to your community, to your providers, um, and to um, the populations that um, you're hoping to um, impact uh, with your research. So um, as you consider all these different data sources, again, um, as you can tell, I always come back to ecosystem. Um, that there, this is really an ecosystem for digital health. It's an ecosystem of health for our communities and, and for um, people who are developing um, technologies or uh, trying to analyze um, the information, the data that we get from them. Um, this is um, a continuum um, of the right technology and the right touch. As I mentioned before, we um, thought about this concept as in the development of Activate. There are things in healthcare that, that require personal touch um, and may require um, in-person or at least um, trusted relationships to do. Things like setting personal and clinical goals, things like addressing barriers to digital and um, health self-efficacy, 
um, you know, uh, things like shared decision making among patients and providers, um, provision of medical interventions and, and procedures, and then addressing um, other kinds of barriers to care. That may require more personal touch. Um, but there's lots of technologies that we can take advantage of. Um, some of the data collection technologies that we've already talked about, like in, in sensors, but medical devices as well. Um, and then interoperable and computable data, right? Making sure that that data from real world sources can be used, can be um, uh, uh, um, developed in ways to make it uh, computable um, and interoperable for use by um, the healthcare system. And then different computation and, and analytic techniques. Um, as we think about you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence, we need to also be thinking about uh, fairness and bias in our algorithms, um, assurance that AI is, is um, uh, providing appropriate um, uh, uh, direction and will be used appropriately. Um, and then you know, other kinds of uh, sort of ethical, um, ethical moral, and, and legal issues. Um, insight generation. Um, uh, again, thinking about decision support, thinking about applying what we learned from our algorithms um, into the practice um, of, of self-management, of, of um, improving your health, and of the provision of healthcare. Uh, thinking about the policy levers, um, at, again, federal, state, and local levels. And then making sure that um, self, that individuals can use all of the technology and um, the, the uh, knowledge that comes out of technology to apply it to their own personal situations, to do self-management, to do care coordination. So it's a balance of the right technology and the right touch. It's not um, just, you know, the, e you are either high tech or high touch. You really can be both but as long as they're balanced in the right um, proportions as you go through interacting um, with individuals and communities. Um, so I, I will stop there um, and um, be open to questions, but I hope that um, this, this talk has, has brought some information to you about why digital health equity is important um, and relevant. Um, to those of you in, in data science um, and uh, brought you some, some things to think about as you proceed in your own research um, using data science to improve um, health and healthcare. And I will um, just let you know that there are references to all the citations that I provided in this talk. Kathy, thank you so much. And uh, I want to uh, just invite any of our participants here that are watching on Zoom to send in any questions they may have via the chat feature, and um, I'll take a look at those and ask them on your behalf uh, with, with Kathy. Kathy, one of the things which I, I want to kind of start at the end of your presentation that you talked about, which I think is kind of important, especially in the context of kind of how we often think of as data science is trying to remove the human from the loop many times. And I liked how you brought in the notion of a personal touch um, where the human is firmly in the loop. And um, what can you share with us any like stories of that as a successful strategy that, uh, you know, has been born out of this model that you've described? Absolutely. Um, I'll give two examples. Um, and that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that, um, Jack. Um, so I'll give you one example from our design process. Um, and that is that um, we had you know, patients and family members who were in our co-designer team. And one of those uh, participants uh, gave, uh, told us a story. Um, she said that you know, she has um, uh, high, high blood pressure among other things. And her doctor had told her, uh, go get a blood pressure machine. You can just go buy it you know, at, at the drugstore. And you need to be measuring your, um, your blood pressure every day and taking care of yourself, right? And then let me know, you know, what your readings are and how it's going. So she was doing what she thought they told her to do. She went to the drugstore, she bought a device, she was measuring it every day. Um, and when she went to talk to the doctor, she said, well, how's it going? Um, and, you know, how are my readings? And the doctor said, I don't have your readings. She thought that it was automatically somehow going to the doctor. <laughs> Um, and, you know, she didn't she didn't know that she had to buy a particular kind that allowed her to connect through Bluetooth and set it up like no one had explained that to her. And then it turned out that um, her blood pressures had not improved 
And she's like, well, I, you know, I was watching the numbers, but she didn't really know what the numbers meant. And she was making some assumptions about them, but no one had sat her down and said, well, this is what they mean and what you should do about it when you see these readings. So all of these kind of points of, of failure for her led to her feeling ashamed, you know, that she had done something that was, you know, she felt ignorant. She felt like, you know, and she'd wasted all this time. So it led to her feeling badly. Fortunately, she's the type of person who didn't let that stop her. And she said, I'm going to be involved in this project because I want you to learn from my experience right, what not to do for the next patient. So it's that personal touch that no one had asked her what she needed to know. No one had said what might get in your way. No one had checked in with her about how it was going. Um, there were just a lot of assumptions made. So that personal touch, someone just talking to her would may have, you know, uh, sort of interrupted that cycle um, early on to make sure that it was going to be useful for her and for, for the doctor. I, um, I think that that usability thing is so important to I me. Mean, we sort of assume that people are, are I don't know, they're, they're, they're just aware enough these days, right? Oh yeah, just go to the store and buy the device and it it will just magically present itself about how you're supposed to deploy it, right? And for some folks that may be more difficult than others and we shouldn't make those assumptions. Absolutely. Um, the other um, example that I would give is, a, 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 I think a very simple example, which is now we have hundreds of patients taking their blood pressures many, many, many times and taking glucometer readings many times. And I'm sure people have said, well, what is the doctor supposed to do with thousands of readings, right? We have 10,000 measures now. What's the doctor supposed to do with all of that, right? What, I mean, how, you know, they're not gonna look at every one of these readings. So how do we make that something that's useful clinically? Um, so one of the things that we did was to be able to graph that information to set, um, to implement threshold levels. Um, that the health center um, determined were ones that, you know, they wanted to um, have information about, uh, uh, about people and to provide um, patterns and trends. Um, because what a clinician will tell you is that this, an individual may have on, on average, you know, a higher blood pressure. And so trying to get them to some arbitrary standard blood pressure um, may not actually be the right decision. Right. But if you don't know what their what their um, their baseline normal blood pressure is, you may just be kind of beaten up on them, get it down, get it down. But you might not realize that, in fact, they have gotten it down. Right. So um, being able to provide that information um, in a in a way that is a personalized to the individual's uh, particular health status and can show a provider what those trends are. Um, on a you know daily, weekly, monthly basis is what makes that information useful. And so those are the kinds of um, you know data visualizations that we are able to provide. And now in that activate um, you know program manager, the provider with the health coach and the uh, the nurse can actually look at all of the patients and at a, at a glance understand um, what those measures mean and can make decisions then with the patient based on on those kinds of trends. So there, again, the, the um, importance of um, understanding the real problem for the clinic's staff and providers was critical to designing a solution that was going to work for them. And that, that came from being embedded and designing with them. Kathy, you talked about like the, you know, folks that you're focused on in rural communities, um, you know, and sort of this topic of familiarity with technology kind of is going to vary widely, right? If you're in a big urban area, you're probably seeing a lot of the technology. If you're in a rural area, you know, maybe you're not as exposed to it. Um, on the other hand, there are people working in those rural communities who not only might they not have access to the technology, um, they might not understand it, but they also may have some reservations about using it. And I'm thinking about undocumented workers, and they may have some serious worries about utilizing technology that might expose them as undocumented. Is uh, that This might be a sensitive topic, but I'm curious if you have any experience with this or, I mean, from yeah. you know, being in the part of California you're in, you might see this from time to time. I'm curious. Absolutely. That's a really big um, concern among, um, particularly among um, agricultural workers, because many of them are undocumented or have family members who are undocumented. And so providing information, even going to um, you know, a hospital 
um, or, you know, in, in the case of COVID, coming to get a COVID vaccine, um, there was a lot of cause for concern about what information will I have to give? What will they do with that information? You know, will they ask me questions that put me at risk or my family members at risk? Um, and so, you know, signing up for the Affordable Connectivity Program, um, which is the federal, you know, program to give every household access to the internet. Um, it, it, there, a lot of people are are um, concerned about doing that because they have to give information to the government. So this partnership at the local level between healthcare organizations and community organizations along with these sort of state and federal programs is really critical because it's the local community-based organization that is the trusted entity to those individual members of the community. So it's really important um, that those trusted entities be, the, um, be involved in delivering the message and in assisting um, individual people. So that's part of this community connectivity framework. This is why you have to have that partnership um, as part of designing the program and developing and implementing the program. You kind of introduced your talk 